Leanne Kingston is found brutally murdered in her own home. Her ex-partner, a prime suspect, until he claims the murderer is their own son. It's the science of blood pattern analysis and glass evidence that reveals the killer's true identity and the grim story of Operation Cargill. A crime scene is a puzzle that has to be solved. A whodunit, a scattering of clues to be deciphered by clever detective work and the power of science. It's a winter's day in a quiet suburb of Auckland, and our case begins. In the afternoon, I had a really bad gut feeling for some reason. I don't know, just something just didn't felt right. I kind of just put it down because it was quite a dreary day. It was quite cold. It was quite a cold day. Then I get this phone call, and it was my husband. Lisa's sister, Leanne, hasn't picked up her daughter from school. There's no way she'd miss a day to pick her children up. So I started phoning Leanne and no answers. So I phoned Mum up and she was like, oh, why don't you just go around there and have a look? I saw the key in the front door and I'm thinking, oh, well, that just seems really, really odd. I opened the door and all of a sudden I got this very big smell of just janola through the whole house, like it had been like clean from top to bottom. And I kind of called out to Leanne, you know, Leanne, are you there? I just saw her hand. I knew that she wasn't alive because everything looked great, even her hand, everything looked grey. Her body was obviously laying behind the door and I couldn't get in there to actually get to her. Lisa called emergency services and waited. I just sat on the steps, just in shock, and I was just in disbelief of what was happening. First to arrive were the paramedics. They could uh, reach her hand from outside and immediately saw that she was deceased. First police there uh, cordoned the scene, cordoned the road off. I was detective sergeant on Crime Squad. Our role is attending and making sure that we go through those initial stages of collecting evidence and, and securing the scene. Initially, we went around to the left of the house where the bathroom or the toilet window was. We could see that there was glass on the, on the ground underneath the actual toilet window. Um, so what we were able to do is grab a ladder from a nearby workman and was able to have a look into the toilet window. I could only actually see really the top half of Leanne's body. As I was looking at it, the door would be opening inwards to the right and she was wedged in the corner. Her left arm was up over her head and there was a lot of blood. Also notice that the glass for the toilet window was actually mainly on the outside, which indicated that that window had been broken from the inside. Not broken by someone getting in, but by someone trying to get out, someone trying to escape. Outside, members of Leanne's family had started to gather. While we were doing our work at the scene and we were organising um, staff to come in to interview the family members who had arrived at the address, Carrie Thurgood turned up at our cordon at the scene, wanting to know what was going on. He was at the outer cordon, whereas the family were sort of in a slightly closer cordon. It had caused quite a stir. He came rushing down to the house saying, what's happened, what's happened? I said, Carrie, she's dead. And he stood there, stood there as, oh, he just stood there, dazed. He puts his hands down and goes, oh, I loved her, I loved her, I loved her. I said to the police, please take him away. Carrie Thurgood was the ex-partner. He and Leanne had been separated for four years. We were a little bit surprised when he turned up, but then again, he is the father of the four children, and it would have been natural behaviour for a person like that to come to the scene. 
As police dealt with matters outside, ESR begin examining the interior. As we entered the house, one of my first impressions was that the curtains in the living room were closed. There were a number of clothes piled up in the living room, but nothing generally out of place. It was a, a typical uh, three-bedroom, single-level house. The toilet was off a long hallway. Immediately outside the toilet, blood was seeping into the carpet. There was no visible blood on the outside of the toilet door, uh, but the bottom of the toilet door frame where the hinge joined, the hinge had come loose. It had been ripped from its hinge, suggesting considerable force had been applied to the door. Her body is lying directly behind the door. Opening it will move Leanne and disturb crucial evidence. It was clearly going to be difficult to one, get her out, uh, and also examine that space. The door is carefully removed from the hinges, allowing investigators the first proper view of the crime scene. There was a significant amount of blood staining in the toilet area and on Ms. Kingston herself. There was a lot of dents in the wall. They also found Leanne's boot in the toilet bowl. Um, there was a little bit of blood, but not a lot, at the broken window. A um, piece of the toilet seat was broken. A rug, which looked as if it had been on the floor, was stuffed into the cistern. As Leanne's body is removed for a post-mortem, it is evident to all she has sustained a brutal attack. She had had a lot of blunt force trauma to the face and the head. She had um, large wounds to both sides of her neck. She had a lot of defensive wounds to her arms. It was a frenzied, brutal, probably prolonged attack. I mean, she's put up a good fight. A fight for her life. But against who? There is a large amount of blood patterning on the walls that may be able to provide scientists with further clues. In order to understand blood pattern analysis, we're creating a demonstration in a lab with world expert Dr. Michael Taylor. First, we create some impact spatter and observe it with a slow speed camera. And action. You can see the individual blood drops actually landing on the wall. And if you follow any individual one, you'll see that the point it lands, it begins to spread, and that spreading results in a blood stain, and the shape of the blood stain has certain characteristics. It's from these characteristics that scientists can decipher what specific actions generated the blood patterning. If we look closely at this one, we can see an elliptical shape stain, and it has a tail pointing upwards and to the right. The tails point away from the impact. Drawn a line here through the blood stain, which gives us an estimate of the direction of the blood drop that caused this stain. This is done with string lines on several droplets from the one impact. So we've done that for five blood stains, and in this case, these five trajectories converge in one area. This convergent point shows the height at which the impact occurred. The ratio of width to length of droplets gives the angle the blood hit the wall. The higher the angle, the rounder the droplet. This gives the third dimension of where the impact occurred in the room, as determined by these string lines. Amazing, all that information just from a simple shape like that. Every stain has a story to tell. In our case, four separate impacts had occurred. The first, as she was standing at a height of 1.5 metres, and the following three impacts descending down to just above the floor. So that was evidence of the attack continuing as she was being beaten down to the ground, which obviously shows the ferocity of, and the termination of the offender. 
But who had brutally beaten her to the floor and killed her? Leanne Kingston has been found dead in her Papakura home. A mother to four children, Leanne herself was a triplet. Her sister Michelle describes her. I think they're the same as us, <laughs> same yeah. as me. Yeah, bubbly, happy, go lucky girl. She's very nurturing, very mothery. She was always helping out at the schools. She used to look after all the other children in the street. She was just a mother hen. If you can describe yeah. an amazing mum, it would be Leanne. She just had a kind heart. You would never ever think, you know, her life would be taken. But sadly, it had. And now investigators had to find out by whom. A partial palm print in blood is detected on the toilet wall. Could this be the killer's print in the victim's blood? Investigators note a curious detail. Small runs of white liquid down the wall. And they'd clearly been applied after the blood had been applied to the surfaces. And this indicated that some effort had been made to clean up the blood. An attempt had been made to cover up this crime. The unusual sequences of dents were photographed and sent to Dr. Coulson for analysis. There are quite a number of indentations, aren't there? There are. So we've got seven that we can see here. And in this photo here, we've got a close-up of one of those indentations. That's quite a significant dent in the wall, isn't it? So we can see that the paint on the wall has cracked and the indentation is pushed in to the wall. So that would mean you'd need a reasonable force to hit the wall to do that sort of damage. They look like the marks of a weapon being swung with some force, evidence that may prove crucial later. In the bathroom next door, partial shoe prints in blood are detected on the floor. The same for the kitchen, partial shoe print impressions were, were visible in blood on the kitchen floor. Luminol enhancement reveals many more. We're able to detect probable bloodstained shoe prints throughout the rest of the house, coming and going from the bedrooms, the lounge and the kitchen area. Indicating a lot of movement with one repeated pattern. And the, the bloodstained shoe prints seem to lead to the curtains. Suggesting the offender was keeping a watchful eye. Chemically enhanced, the prints reveal the same tread pattern. One of the pieces of information we were able to give the police relatively early was that we suspected that there was only one individual involved. Investigators were working on a list of possible suspects. We found out who was on bail, prison releases, people on parole for violent offending um, living in the area. Records reveal that just one day before her murder, Leanne had filed a complaint with police. She'd gone into the Papakura police station the previous day on the Sunday afternoon to report some suspicious activity and in particular property getting damaged, such as somebody had managed to get into the house without forcing entry and poured water into her TV and damaged some other electrical appliances within the house. There was a series of tyre slashings on Leanne's car in the driveway, and that had been going on for quite some weeks. Family members had finally convinced Leanne to lay the complaint. It was their belief her ex-partner, Carrie Thurgood, was to blame. She actually believed it was someone else, and um, everybody else thought it was Carrie. In the 20 years Leanne and Thurgood had been together, the family had witnessed many signs of abuse. He was always having to go at her for something. Over the years, he'd been violent towards her. He's broken her ribs before. He whacked her around the head with a frozen meat pack, which gave her a big hematoma on her eye. Leanne's family believe this history of abusive behaviour has now escalated to her death. Police interview Thurgood regarding Leanne's complaint, as well as details of his whereabouts on the day of her murder. He was on a day off, going different places, 
dropping his children off at their respective schools, visiting friends during the day, making telephone calls. He was asked whether he went to Cargill Street that day. He said that he had driven past the address earlier that morning, but that Leanne's car wasn't there, so he hadn't stopped. But within the first few hours of the investigation, a potentially strong piece of evidence appeared to suggest otherwise. A lot of the neighbours knew Kerry by his first name. He was a frequent visitor to the address. He also mowed lawns and he had a few clients along the street. So he was reasonably well known in the neighbourhood. Police had begun area inquiries and they found an occupant in the street who said they had seen Thurgood that afternoon in the street, walking away from the scene address, carrying a black rubbish bag. This doesn't match Thurgood's account of his day. Is the neighbour mistaken, or has Thurgood intentionally misled police? Leanne Kingston has been brutally murdered in her own home. Her ex-partner has provided an alibi which investigators are looking into. So he'd said that he had dropped the children at school and we interviewed the children and we made inquiries at the schools to confirm that. He said that he had visited a friend of his and we interviewed that friend and confirmed, yes, he'd seen him, called in for a cup of coffee. Thurgood also said he'd gone into his place of work and made some phone calls. Probably of significance, everyone we spoke to that had had contact with him that day all said how calm and normal he was, he, that he wasn't stressed or showing any anxiety or anything like that. Not the expected demeanour of a man who just committed a brutal and bloody murder. And Thurgood's alibi was checking out. His visit to his workplace was even corroborated with him clearly appearing in their security camera footage. Thurgood was nearly off the hook. But unlucky for him, these investigating officers were leaving no stone unturned. The officers doing that inquiry, as they were leaving, they saw that there was a, a skip bin. So they stopped and had a look in the skip bin and found three rubbish sacks. So the rubbish bags weren't tied up. Um, the officers, at a glance, could see what was in them contents that immediately had the officer's attention. A lot of bloody clothing, a piece of stick or a broken handle that had blood on it. What's revealed resembles a homicide kit. A set of clothing which includes a t-shirt from Thurgood's place of work. A lot of objects are visibly blood-stained. A beanie with crudely cut holes suggests it has been worn as a balaclava there are items potentially used to restrain and attack. And others which appear to be used in a cleanup. One is labelled with Leanne's surname. Bags of crucial evidence. The finding of those items in the skip bin, um, it was gold really for us. Investigators suspect the bloodied broken wooden handle to be the murder weapon and the source of the dents in the wall. It's sent to Dr Coulson for further analysis. What I found was that the wooden handle could have made these marks, but so could any other curved object of about the same size. That wasn't strong enough evidence. Next, Dr Coulson examined the wooden handle for any features that could link it to the crime scene. Just in this area here, which looks white, of very, very small fragments of paint. So I looked at the layer structure or the number of layers in those. And we can see that the paint goes white, yellow, white. So there are three layers of paint present in that sample. Right, so wherever that paint came from had been painted three times. That's right. And specifically white, yellow and white. Correct. So then I compared this paint to the paint from the plasterboard. Now, they look like the same piece of paint. Were you able to further test them chemically in some way? Yes, we did. So each layer was tested using a number of analytical techniques, and each layer corresponded. So what that means is that that paint from the wooden handle could have come from this plasterboard. 
When combined, the paint and the wall analysis created very strong forensic evidence that the handle had made the dents in the wall. DNA analysis confirms the blood on it is Leanne's. It all points to the broken handle being the murder weapon. The blood on the clothing in the skip bin is also confirmed to be Leanne's. Another profile has been identified, a saliva stain that has been found in the beanie. We obtained a partial profile and it corresponded to Mr Thurgood. And further evidence of Thurgood is found in a semen stain on a pair of underpants. The underpants were sort of attached to the track pants, so as if somebody had, had worn both garments and taken them off at the same time. On the outside, the victim's blood. On the inside, Thurgood's DNA. This puts Thurgood clearly at the murder scene. Police now execute a search warrant on Thurgood's house. So in a case like this where there's been significant bloodshed at the scene, an obvious type of evidence that could be transferred to another location is blood. And so the search of the suspect's house was largely a search for blood staining from Miss Kingston. Firstly, with a bright light to locate any visible stains, followed by a luminol test. Very little as far as blood staining went. There were a few surfaces where we did detect blood. Investigators searched for further signs of a cleanup. We found a black t-shirt and a pair of denim cut-off shorts in the washing. They'd been washed. They matched the items that he was wearing when he'd been to his work earlier that day. These were sent to ESR for further analysis. Outside, in the garden, a broken handle is spotted, almost completely hidden. Once searchers remove it, they can see it's a broken grubber. Does this relate to the bloodied murder weapon found in the skip bin? And if so, can these two broken parts be scientifically matched together? No two similar items will ever break the same way twice. It's that uniqueness of a break that enables scientists to make a link between two parts. Matching features and patterning on the broken edges can be proof of a physical fit, and that the two parts were once one. The conclusion with this item was that the bloodstained handle from behind Finn McCall's was once part of the grubber that was located in Mr Thurgood's backyard, and we were able to say that conclusively. Police now have strong scientific evidence that the murder weapon has come from Thurgood's own backyard. The next piece of evidence clearly places him at the murder. The palm print found in the victim's blood on the wall has now been identified as belonging to Carrie Thurgood. It's all starting to stack up. Probably the strongest case I'd ever had, ever had um for any type of offending. It was really just overwhelming. We had um, st strong evidence that Carrie was involved and we charged him with murder. Two days after Leanne's death, Thurgood is charged and remanded in custody. The police confident in the large amount of evidence pointing to him as Leanne's murderer. But that was all about to change. What happened next shocked everyone. Police receive a phone call from Thurgood's lawyer, who had a new claim from his client. And said that Thurgood's oldest son had apparently phoned Thurgood on the day of the murder and confessed to killing his mother. This is a twist police weren't expecting. Well, quite surprised. Uh, this was an unusual turn of events. Thurgood was now admitting that, yes, he did go to the scene, but only because of this phone call he had from his son, and that when he got there, he found Leanne already deceased, and that he cleaned up the scene in order to try and protect his son. Investigators now question the evidence. 
Could all of the bloody clothing be explained by a father trying to cover up for his son? The son lived with his father, so he too had access to the murder weapon. And surely a guilty man wouldn't dump the evidence in the skip bin at his own work. Then police receive further information from one of Thurgood's close friends, who also claims to have received a call from the son confessing to the murder of his mother. He also went on to say that some days previously, this same son had told him that uh, he should kill his mother because it was going to make things easier for his dad. So obviously this was something we were going to have to look at very closely. So we re-interviewed the son. He, of course, denied any involvement or any knowledge. He said he'd been at his course all day, from being dropped off in the morning by his father till he was picked up by his father later that afternoon. Police conduct interviews with teachers and classmates on the son's course and determine he never left the campus all day. But what about the phone calls Thurgood and his friend claimed to have received from the son? We identified every phone that Morby and Thurgood had access to that day, every phone that the older son had had access to that day, and phone records conclusively showed that there was no phone calls between the son and either Thurgood or Morby. Thurgood's allegation that his own son committed the murder is now dismissed. Oh, you know straight away if you know our, my eldest nephew that it's all lies. <laughs> um, he wouldn't hurt a fly, so straight away we didn't, we didn't even buy into that story whatsoever. He's deluded, basically. If he thinks that we're going to think that his, her own son would actually kill his mother, um, yeah, it, just, it was just delusional. The investigation swings its full focus back on Carrie Thurgood. At ESR, the second set of clothes Thurgood wore on the day of the murder have been examined. Even though they had been through the wash, several small blood stains were detected. In this case, the sample from the fly actually gave us a reasonable amount of DNA. And so it was probably about half of what I'd ideally want, um, but still it was enough to obtain a full DNA profile. So that result was a full profile corresponding to Miss Kingston. This raises a crucial question. If he only went to the house once to clean up, why does he have two sets of bloodied clothes? Thurgood is re-interviewed in prison. His story changes once again. He didn't know who had committed it. He somehow or other thought that his older son had committed it. And so to protect him, he went to the scene and cleaned up. He conceded that after that clean up, he had blood on his clothing and that he dumped the clothing in the skip bin at work. But that doesn't account for the second set of bloodied clothing. So he couldn't explain why, if he'd only been to the scene on one occasion, did he have two sets of bloodstained clothing. Investigators knew the clothes provided evidence that Thurgood had been to the house twice. Police suspected first to commit murder and the second time to clean up. But could they prove it? It was the unwashed clothes from the skip bin that held vital clues, as Dr Sally Coulson demonstrates. So we've got quite a lot of debris that's come off here, both fibres from the hat and any dirt and so on. So now we need to transfer that to a Petri dish. Under the microscope, the debris reveals telltale signs. You'll see what looks like small fragments of colourless glass. They're minute, aren't they? The edges also look freshly broken, so they're nice and shiny. That's an indication that they're from a glass object that's broken recently. Why would Thurgood have glass on his clothes when the window had been broken from the inside? 
It's what scientists call backward fragmentation. Oh. When a sheet of glass is broken, around 30% of the glass shatters back towards the impact. So if I pause that... That's incredible. So here we can see all the glass that's broken out of that window frame and we can see some small and some big fragments that have backscattered back towards where you were standing and then a lot more glass has gone the way that the hammer's going. That's really surprising. These little speckles that look like dust, those are tiny fragments of glass that are landing on you. And how long will that stay on my clothing for? So the bigger fragments will fall off almost instantly, but those small fragments can stay for up to 24 hours. Can people just get glass on their clothing incidentally? We did a study where we looked at the clothing of people that went to gyms and when they got changed, we examined their daytime clothing for fragments and glass and basically there was no glass on the surfaces of the clothing. Which makes glass really good evidence then. It does, so if you've got glass on your clothing, it means that you've been near a source of breaking glass, so within about three metres, and within a time period of about 24 hours. Proving Thurgood had been within three metres of a breaking window, and science could even determine exactly which window that glass was from. How do you do that comparison? So we measure something called refractive index. The bending of light as it passes through a medium is called refraction. And so we take advantage of that and we measure that bending or that angle, and that can give us the refractive index of the glass fragment. A fragment of the glass is mounted on a slide and special silicon oil is added. The oil is calibrated. Its refractive index is already known at a range of temperatures. The glass is crushed into smaller pieces. OK, and so that's one fragment mounted and ready to be analysed. The slide is then heated and the glass fragments microscopically observed. Sally selects areas she wants to measure, edges of glass with a good contrast. She sets the machine to slowly cool the sample. And what you'll see is those bright lines will look less bright and the dark lines less dark until they get to a point where it looks like the fragments disappeared. And that's the match point. They disappear because the light is bending equally in both substances. The changing temperature of the oil has reached the refractive index point of the glass. This gives scientists the ability to link glass fragments to each other and a source. The glass of the toilet window was compared to the fragments on Thurgood's clothing. So we had quite a lot of glass in this case. We measured the refractive indices of 38 of those fragments, and 37 of them matched the window from the toilet. That's a pretty strong link, isn't it? First of all, that's a lot of glass to have on your clothing. It shows that you've been near some source of breaking glass. And the fact that it matches the toilet window gives very strong evidence that the person wearing that clothing was close to that toilet window when it broke. That showed us that Carrie Thurgood was in that toilet cubicle at the time the window was broken. Evidence that suggested Carrie Thurgood was doing far more than just cleaning up. As part of the investigation into Leanne's murder, police search Thurgood's vehicles and discover more evidence of his manipulative behaviour. Concealed and tied to the carjack of his four-wheel drive, they find a small bag. And inside the bag was a, a car key and some jewellery. And when we uh, spoke to the family, they were able to identify the jewellery as pieces that Thurgood had bought for Leanne years previous, that jewellery had then gone missing and over the years Thurgood had basically abused Leanne for having lost it. But as it turned out, the whole time he had it. 
In the weeks prior to her death, Leanne had finally been able to move on. Her life had changed, and for the better. She had begun a new relationship, and according to family, she was starting to find her own way and starting to drift apart from Thurgood. She was happy, you know, I've never seen her that happy. I purely put it down to the fact that he was just jealous that she was moving on and she'd actually found some strength. On the night before she was murdered, Leanne stayed at her new boyfriend's house while the children stayed with their father, Thurgood. But late that night after the children went to bed, Thurgood was out buying petrol at a service station near Leanne's house at 11.30 p.m. He must have snuck out of the house, got in his car, and was driving around Leanne's neighborhood. So he would have, um, if he'd driven past her house, he would have seen that her car wasn't there. Was that the final straw? Did her not being home fuel his jealousy and feed his murderous intent? As the trial approaches, police interview Leanne and Thurgood's children. Two of the children, who cannot be identified due to a court order, recall that last morning at their father's house. He was very agitated in the morning because we didn't do the dishes and he kept telling us to hurry up. Um, you could see something was wrong in the morning. OK, what about you? What sort of things can you remember? Pretty much just him yelling at me whenever I spoke about Mum. He didn't, he wasn't happy. Thurgood took the children to their respective schools. The last drop-off was around 9am. So after dropping the children off at their school, he's then gone to her home. Leanne would have been home from her boyfriends by then. Keys in the door suggest he has surprised her inside the house. Damage to the toilet door indicates a struggle. The window is broken. Her blood and fragments of glass are on the clothes he admitted to wearing. On the green jacket, scientists find a pattern of small blood stains, projected blood stains in Leanne's blood. Not just simply transferred by wiping it against the wall or something like that. So that showed that the wear of the jacket had been there at the time that Leanne was assaulted. Thurgood leaves his palm print in Leanne's blood on the wall. He also leaves bloodied footprints throughout the house. After he'd finished brutally murdering the mother of his children, Thurgood has then carefully collected up his murder kit, which he puts into rubbish bags. We know he left her house around 10 a.m. A neighbor saw Thurgood getting into his car. He's driven home, he's got changed, he's had a shower, he's gone to his work. CCTV has him there in his second set of clothes. He's disposed of the, the rubbish bags containing all the evidence into the skip bin. Evidence that has his DNA and Leanne's blood all over it. The bins had been emptied just the night before. If the timing had been different, we could have lost our evidence and uh, we would never have known about that. He had made a purchase from a supermarket at about 11.10 on the day of Leanne's death and he had purchased a bottle of bleach. The bleach was purchased from a supermarket across the road from his work. Bleach was significant because we knew that somebody had tipped bleach all around the scene in an effort to clean up. He visits a friend who confirms he's there until around noon. And then he's returned to the scene that afternoon. He's used the bleach, he's tipped it all around the toilet, tried to clean up further. He left Leanne's house between 1 and 1.45 in the afternoon. This is when another neighbour saw him walking in the street with a rubbish bag. So I think that rubbish sack was probably not recovered. I don't think it's one that was put into the skip bin. He's 
gone home, he's uh, put the clothing that he was wearing during the clean-up into his washing machine. At 2.20pm, he starts the school run. Thurgood was meant to pick up the older children, but not the youngest, who Leanne was collecting. I was confused. I was waiting for my mum the whole time. And when he had picked me up, I was like saying, where's mum? He would not answer me. And when I said it again, he got angry. But I wanted to go to her house, but he didn't want to. Yeah, I was like suspicious. And as soon as we got home, he kept on pestering me to call mum. So I kept on calling her home phone, but she didn't pick up the phone at all. By this time, Leanne has been dead for many hours, a fact that only Thurgood knew. Thurgood pled not guilty to murder. The jury took just two hours to reject his defence, and he was sentenced to life to serve a minimum of 19 years for the murder of Leanne Kingston. He pled guilty to perverting the course of justice. His attempt to blame his son was an aggravating feature, with an extra 18-month sentence imposed. I personally feel it's, it's justified um, because I think he's going to be at the a later end of his living era and he's also spent 19 and a half years hopefully doing nothing and getting nowhere. Yeah, he's got his due. I want to know why he did it. And till this day, I will never know. To be honest, the way I feel about him is I feel disgusted. Losing my mum was like, she was everything to me. My best friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what he did to her was out of um, selfishness and his bitterness and jealousy. We were devastated, absolutely devastated because we're such a close-knit family. And I used to be so judgmental of people. I'm not anymore, because it can happen to anybody. We got justice for Leanne's family, and that has always been very important to me. Any woman or anybody that's being subjected to physical or emotional abuse needs to report it, needs to get something done. They don't need to put up with what Leanne went through leading up to her death. Four children have had to grow up without a mother. But thanks to the detailed work of forensic investigators, science helped determine exactly who killed Leanne Kingston and a family could begin to rebuild.